in order to ensure that a particular culture continues they have enforced sexual reproduction within a system of heterosexual marriage this system relies on specific gender roles to guarantee the ongoing reproduction of that kinship system however this association of natural sex with distinct gender roles and an assumed natural attraction to the opposite gender is actually a cultural construct aimed at furthering reproductive interests feminist studies in cultural anthropology and kinship have demonstrated how cultures follow specific conventions not only for producing and exchanging goods but also for maintaining kinship bonds this involves setting taboos and enforcing rules around reproduction for instance scholars like levi strauss have shown how the incest taboo directs sexuality into heterosexual marriage gail rubin has argued that this taboo leads to the formation of distinct gender identities and sexual orientations butler's point is that one way the system of compulsory heterosexuality is perpetuated and hidden is by shaping bodies into distinct sexes with supposedly natural appearances and predispositions towards heterosexuality despite the assumption of progress beyond traditional kinship structures butler along with rubin argue that contemporary gender identities are traces of lingering kinship norms the idea that sex gender and heterosexuality are historical constructs that have become accepted as natural over time has been discussed critically by various scholars including foucault wittig gay historians and cultural anthropologists however these theories lack the resources to thoroughly consider how these constructs are produced reproduced and sustained in the realm of physical bodies Butler asked the question can phenomenology help in a feminist understanding of how sex gender and sexuality have become deeply ingrained in the body firstly focusing on the acts through which cultural identity is formed is a good starting point for feminists trying to grasp how bodies are shaped into genders understanding the body as a way of enacting cultural norms helps us to comprehend how these norms are embodied and put into practice however it is hard if not impossible to fully grasp the scale and systematic nature of women's oppression if we only focus on individual acts as the starting point while individual acts do play a role in maintaining oppressive systems oppression is not solely a result of these acts it could be argued that without individuals carrying out acts that contribute to oppressive conditions these conditions might crumble but it is important to note that the relationship between acts and conditions is not straightforward there are broader social contexts and conventions that not only make these acts possible but even make them conceivable as acts in the first place so transforming social relations depends on changing the dominant social conditions rather than solely focusing on individual acts if we stick only to a politics of acts we risk addressing only the indirect or superficial manifestations of those conditions think of gender as an act in a theatrical sense this shifts away from the idea that it is purely an individual endeavor instead it is a shared experience and a form of collective action much like in feminist theory where personal experiences are seen in relation to broader political structures here acts are viewed through a less individualistic lens which helps address criticisms of act theory as too focused on individual choices gender is not something you do on your own while there are personal ways of expressing gender the fact that one engages in this act and follows certain societal rules and restrictions is not solely an individual matter family dynamics can influence this too but they typically reflect and refine existing cultural norms rather than creating entirely new ones the act of gender is not something entirely new it is like a script that has been performed before with individual actors giving it life again 
to understand how people perform their genders together you need to break down the various elements involved anthropologist victor turner points out that social actions like gender expression involve repetition and reenactment of established meanings this is how social norms are reaffirmed and made legitimate when it comes to gender even though individual bodies express these meanings in their unique ways it is a public action there is a collective and temporal aspect to it and this public nature is important because it helps maintain gender within its traditional framework gender is not just a personal choice or something forced upon individuals it is not like the body is a blank slate passively receiving cultural messages rather individuals are already part of the performance and they interpret and act out their gender within the existing cultural guidelines it is similar to how a play can be performed in different ways but it still follows the script and requires interpretation similarly gendered behavior takes place within the constraints of established cultural norms in a theatrical setting it is possible to say this is just a performance separating it from reality this distinction allows us to maintain our sense of what is real even when faced with a temporary challenge to our usual assumptions about gender on the street or in public transportation however the act becomes potentially dangerous because there are no theatrical cues to signal that it is purely imaginary in these everyday settings there is no presumption that the act is different from reality which can be unsettling while some theater attempts to challenge or break down these distinctions between the imaginary and the real they still confront the same phenomenon the act is not contrasted with reality but constitutes a new kind of reality that does not easily fit into existing categories that govern gender from the perspective of established categories one might want to assert that a person is really a girl or a boy and that their appearance contradicts their gender reality the transvestite challenges not only the distinction between sex and gender but also the separation of appearance from reality that is common in how we think about gender identity gender reality is performative which means it is only real when it is being acted out some acts are typically seen as expressions of an underlying gender identity either conforming to expectations or challenging them this assumption is based on our perception of sex which is understood as the physical characteristics associated with being male or female however if gender attributes and acts are performative they actually create the identity they are set to express this means there is no pre-existing identity to measure and act against and no clear distinction between true or false real or distorted acts of gender the idea of a fixed gender identity is revealed as a constructed concept and the belief in an essential sex or enduring masculinity or femininity is part of the strategy to hide the performative nature of gender gender is not like a role that shows or hides some inner self whether that self is linked to a specific sex or not instead gender is a performance that actively creates the idea of an internal psychological identity this is different from the idea put forth by irving goffman who suggests that people take on and switch between various roles in response to societal expectations in this view the sense of self is not something deeply personal it is shaped by social conversations and norms even the idea of having an inner self is a publicly established and authorized way of creating a sense of identity genders cannot be labeled as true or false real or fake however we are still living in a world where genders are seen as clear cut labels where they are seen as fixed and unchangeable this way of thinking about gender contradicts its fluid and changeable nature it is a way of enforcing rules about how gender should be expressed and controlled getting your gender wrong leads to various punishments both obvious and indirect 
doing it right gives a sense of security that there is a fixed gender identity after all. The fact that this sense of security can quickly turn into anxiety and that our culture often punishes or isolates those who do not conform to the idea of a fixed gender shows that deep down we know that the truth or falseness of gender is something socially enforced and not something set in stone. This perspective on gender does not claim to be a complete theory of what gender is or how it is formed. It also does not prescribe a specific feminist political agenda. Different people might use this view of gender for various political strategies. Some might argue that any theory about how gender is formed has political implications and separating it from feminist politics is impossible. Butler agrees with this and asserts that it is primarily political interests that shape the social concept of gender. Without a thorough critique of how gender is formed, feminist theory misses how oppression influences the fundamental categories we use to think about gender. Spivak has argued that feminists sometimes need to use practical form of essentialism, a simplified understanding of women as a universal group, in order to advance feminist political goals. She acknowledges that the term women does not fully capture the diversity and complexity of the group it refers to, but suggests using it strategically. Julia Kristeva suggests something similar, implying that feminists can use the category of women as a political tool without implying that it has some inherent reality. In strict terms, she argues women can't be said to exist. Feminists might be concerned about the political consequences of claiming that women do not exist, especially given Mary Ann Warren's arguments in her book Genderside. Warren argues that policies related to population control and reproductive technology aim to limit or even eliminate the existence of women. In light of this, it might be more useful to focus on practical political action rather than getting caught up in metaphysical debates. However, using the term women in this way and recognizing its philosophical limitations is different from advocating for a normative vision of feminist theory that celebrates or liberates a supposed essence, nature or shared cultural reality that cannot actually be identified. Butler is not trying to redefine the world from a singular women's perspective. She is not sure what the perspective is and it is not for her to claim. It would only be partly correct to say that Butler is interested in how the concept of men's and women's perspective is formed. While Butler believes these perspectives are socially constructed and it is important to critically examine their origins, her primary focus is on understanding how the category of woman itself is established. Some feminist literary critics suggest that assuming sexual difference is fundamental to all discourse, but this perspective solidifies sexual difference as the fundamental aspect of culture. It prevents an analysis not only how sexual difference originates, but also how it is continually shaped by the masculine tradition that dominates the universal perspective and by feminist positions that construct the unified category of women in the pursuit of expressing and liberating an oppressed group. As Foucault argues about humanist attempts to free marginalized individuals, the subject that is liberated often ends up even more deeply constrained than initially thought. Butler believes that examining the history of gender requires certain philosophical assumptions, particularly the idea of an act that is shaped by society and history. This act is performative, as she explained earlier. However, alongside this historical analysis, we need a political approach to how gender acts are performed. This approach should not only redefine existing gender identities, but also suggest what kind of gender reality we should aim for. In doing so, we must reveal the solidification of gender identities that serve as assumed cores and uncover the act and the strategy of denial that both create 
and conceal our experience of gender. This prescription is challenging because we need to imagine a world where acts, gestures and physical attributes associated with gender do not carry inner and meaning. This is not an utopian idea but rather an urgent call to recognize the existing complexity of gender that our language often obscures and to integrate this complexity into our cultural interactions without punitive consequences. It is still politically crucial to represent women, but we must do so in a way that does not distort or solidify the very collective identity that the theory aims to liberate. Feminist theory, which starts from the assumption of sexual difference as an essential and unchanging concept, is certainly an improvement over humanist discourses that equate the universal with masculinity and consider all of culture as male-dominated. It is important to revisit the texts of Western philosophy from various excluded perspectives not only to expose the specific viewpoint and interest behind seemingly objective descriptions of reality, but also to offer alternative viewpoints and recommendations. This helps establish philosophy as a cultural practice and critique its principles from marginalized cultural standpoints. Butler's concern is that we should not turn sexual difference into a fixed concept that unintentionally maintains a binary limit on gender identity and an implicitly heterosexual framework for understanding gender, gender identity and sexuality. In her view, femaleness is not something inherent that is waiting to be expressed. Instead, there is a lot about the diverse experiences of women that is being expressed and still needs to be expressed. However, we need to be cautious with our theoretical language as it does not merely describe a pre-linguistic experience but also constructs that experience and defines the boundaries of its analysis. Despite the widespread influence of patriarchy and the prevalence of sexual difference as a significant cultural distinction, a binary gender system is not something that is given or inherent. Gender as a cultural realm enacted on the body is fundamentally a creative endeavor. It is important to recognize that there are severe consequences for challenging the established script by deviating from expectations or introducing unscripted elements. Gender is not passively imposed on the body, nor is it solely determined by nature, language, symbols or the long history of patriarchy. It is something we continually put on, often under pressure, every day. Recognizing this ongoing act as a natural or linguistic given means relinquishing the power to expand the cultural field through subversive performances of various kinds.